Hi everybody and welcome to Heart to Heart with Gary Reinhardt. I am your host, Gary Reinhardt. I'm here with the Conservation Educator for Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District, Caitlin Stewart. How are you doing tonight? Hey, I'm doing well. Hey, Dakland Radio listeners. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we're here to talk about invasive species, which is a big thing, especially in the summer. People have uh, seen all the different posters and the washing stations, and we'll get all to that. So, but a quick little bit about yourself. Uh, How long have you been doing this? Sure. I've had the pleasure of working for Hamilton County Soil and Water for 10 years. This is my dream job, and I go to work every day excited. My manager, Elizabeth Mangle, is spectacular. Our conservation technician, Lenny Crute, is amazing. He is the boots on the ground. He's in the field, rain or shine. And we have a new face at the district, Marge Remus. She is our clerk, and she's doing a beautiful job as well. So we are a team, and it is a joy to work alongside these people. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, I'm glad to see the excitement in, in something like this. Of course, I've heard it throughout when I was in school and growing up. We had uh, like the poster contest and the essay contest sure. and all that. Um, so what exactly are invasive species? Right. So your Jeopardy term for the night. Invasive species come from other countries and they're introduced beyond the borders of their historic range. And by historic range, we mean any, any place around 1800s, 1850s. So a native species would be here for hundreds of years. So these invasive species are being introduced beyond the borders of their historic range, and they're coming into the United States and they don't have any of the checks and balances that are present on their home turf. So the diseases, the things that eat them, the herbivores, if if you're talking about plants, um, the carnivores, omnivores, if you're talking about animals. And without those checks and balances found on their home turf, their populations explode here in the United States and they're reproducing unchecked. And they also cause economic ecologic or societal harm. That's the key to an invasive species. It's causing some type of harm. So how come nature doesn't adjust to an invasive species? Like you would think at some point, some animal would find it and be like, oh, maybe this is delicious treat. Invasive species are incredible at adapting at their new environment. So they're able to, if we're talking about plants, begin their growing season earlier than our native plants and that growing season is extended past the point that our native plants are living. So they're able to adapt to their environment in ways that our our native plants or animals are unable to. So they have these incredible adaptive strategies that allow them to survive here in the United States and allow them to reproduce very, very quickly. All right, so you mentioned that uh, invasive species come from other countries. Can you also have invasive species that are have a base here in the United States, but they just happen to be like, say, something from Michigan, something from California that happens to come here? Sure. Something here in New York State could be considered native, but in Arizona, it could be considered invasive. So you, you have these geographic boundaries that are not necessarily separated by oceans. They're separated based in the continent that the invasive species has taken hold of. So they certainly are not limited to being transferred from Europe to the United States. There are invasive species here in the United States that are invasive to one area and native to another. Now, what are some of the most popular invasive species around uh, these parts? Sure. Hamilton County has a number of invasive plants Our four big ones are purple loosestrife, Japanese knotweed, garlic mustard, and common reed grass. So these are kind of the poster children for the plants. We also have a crustacean called the spiny water flea that has invaded Sakandaga Lake, Lake Pleasant, and Indian Lake. And we have a couple of invasive insects that we're really keeping an eye out here for that aren't here yet. Invasive insects like the hemlock woolly adelgid, Asian longhorned beetle. 
I know um, well, I worked at the DEC, and my dad and my brother also, who worked for the DEC, have this. Uh, the emerald ash borer is a big concern. Yes. Um, especially in firewood, and the DEC puts out. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a law and not just a, a suggestion that you can only transport uh, firewood. I think it's like 20, 25 miles. I believe it's a 50 mile radius from the original source. The Department of Environmental Conservation has done a beautiful job with their Don't Move Firewood campaign. You see the signs at the DEC campgrounds. And Gary, like you said, you hit the nail on the head. These invasive insects are moving around in firewood. So that's a main vector for the invasive insects. And with this Don't Move Firewood campaign and the law that you mentioned, if a person, a camper, purchases firewood, that firewood cannot be moved within a 50, beyond a 50 mile radius. And that's just to make sure that these invasive insects aren't moving from place to place. It's trying to keep their populations in check to, and slow the spread. Yeah, and I know also working with the DEC, they have their own ways of uh, trying to sh uh, show the different invasive species. I remember one was uh, with a kids program where they had them draw aliens because that's what they kind of considered them. like they're aliens that are invading our area, yes. which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, I know DEC has their own wood that they sell that all comes pre-wrapped and yes. everything, which yes. is always... This is always a joy to mm -hmm. have to carry. <laughs> yes. And I should, I should also mention, too, that people who cut down their own firewood, that firewood is restricted as well. So the firewood that you purchase alongside the road or from a, a firewood company, it should be kiln dried. And you should receive a little certificate that says the firewood has been kiln dried. And that drying method will kill all life stages of the invasive insects that are harbored in that firewood. So it's a process of drying the wood, heating it to a point that's killing these invasive insects. And that's just another really good check to make sure that people aren't spreading these invaders around. Yeah, it's lucky that the DEC has stickers that have them approved with each uh, thing of wood, mm -hmm. which, which definitely helps out. Yes. Now, what can we do as common folk to try and help curb these invasive species other than what you had mentioned. Sure. There's a great slogan and the slogan goes clean, drain, dry. So for aquatic invasive species, things like Eurasian water milfoil, variable leaf milfoil, spiny water flea, you can clean, drain, dry your equipment before you leave the boat launch. So you're checking to make sure your boat motor, your oars, your paddles, your gear, your pets don't have invasive plants or invasive animals clinging to them. Things like zebra mussels, Asian clam that could stick to the outside of a kayak or the, the gunnel of a canoe. And so you're doing a visual inspection of the boats. You're draining all water from bait buckets, from bilge. You're turning your kayak upside down and teetering it like it was on a seesaw to make sure that water is drained from all compartments of your gear. And finally, you can dry your equipment for at least 48 hours before launching into your next adventure on a lake or on a river. All right, so you mentioned the boats and uh, those who have come in the summer and have brought their boats have noticed a big increase in people and, and like washing stations. Uh, there was one at the Lemon Tree, there's one uh, right outside of town at the, uh, I guess what you call it, the turnaround. Uh, Moffitt's Beach, we had one. Mm -hmm. um, and these are put on by the Paul Smith's Watershed Institute. Yes. So have you been working closely with Paul Smith's on uh, these various things? We, we hope that we are Paul Smith's Adirondack Watershed Institute's best customer. <laughs> and we utilize their boat wash stations frequently. Uh, the Conservation District monitors 21 lakes in June, July, and August. And we trailer a motorboat with, uh, with, a, with a motor on it. And 
got to say I've been very empowered to have taken over this program the last two years. So I am driving the boat. I'm watching that sucker and I haven't crashed uh, recently. <laughs> my, my first time out, I was on Paseco and it was super, super shallow and totally wrenched up the the motor. So took her uh, took her to Lake Pleasant Marine. They fixed me right up and knock on wood, haven't had any accidents like that since. So hard, hard lesson learned, but... Like I said, it's very empowering, but because we're moving between 21 lakes every month in June, July, and August, we want to make certain that we are not transporting invasive species. So we're utilizing the boat wash stations that Paul Smith's Adirondack Watershed Institute has in our area. Okay, so the, the boat wash station, the boat wash station on Route 30 and the <coughs> station at Pasico, we utilize frequently. Whenever they're open, we're going by, we're pulling in. It takes three to five minutes and the stewards will have a high, a hot, the stewards will have a hot pressure wash that they blast your boat down with. And that's helping to kill any invasive species that have clung onto it or remove any fragments of invaders. And we also make sure that our anchor bucket is soaked because we are monitoring for lakes that have spiny water flea in it. And at the end of those lakes, we will go back to the district and bleach that equipment to make sure that we're not transporting spiny water flea. So bleach is a great disinfectant for spiny water flea. So these, uh, these boat wash stations are super valuable and the stewards get you in, get you out. It's a great educational tool. And I, 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 they, they have removed hundreds and hundreds of invasive species from boats in the Adirondacks. They're doing a bang up job with it. Yeah, and that's uh, very important. And they've been doing this for a few years, at least that I've seen. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been out and about. And uh, when I worked at Moffitt's, they had a table that also had all the information you could want about invasive species, which was also pretty impressive. Yes, yes. You know, a couple of locals, Darcy Fouch, Mike Vale, they are Adirondack Watershed Institute stewards, and they are at those tables handing out that information. They have samples of specimens of the spiny water flea, the Asian clam. They may have some Eurasian water mill foil so that the public can see what these invaders look like. And it's, it's just, it's getting conservation on the ground. Now, do we have any like invasive species like on the horizon, like new threats that we should start looking out for? Right. So huge ones for insects, Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock woolly adelgid, and emerald ash borer. They could possibly be here in Hamilton County and we just haven't noticed them. Often with these invasive insects, it takes a while to realize that they are on the landscape because their infestations need to be of a great amount of, um, it takes a lot of insects to see mm -hmm. something like that invading a tree. So oftentimes, you know, the infestation may be here for five or 10 years before it's noticed. So. Yeah, and uh, I've seen uh, pictures in that of what damage they can do. And we, uh, around here especially, take our nature very seriously as not only part of the economy, but also just part of our life here. You know, we have all the animals and the beautiful trees, and that's what makes it very uh, lovely to live up here. So it's uh, very important to try and make sure that all these uh, threats are taken care of. Now, if I'm out hiking or uh, that, and I notice, say I notice a, be a like a, a beetle of some sort, who would I call and say, and say, hey, I found this beetle that looks just like the, the Japanese? Absolutely. Um, you can certainly call Hamilton County Soil and Water. Uh, our phone number is 518-548. 3991. And you can check out our website for some pictures of native lookalikes versus their native counter or their, versus their invasive counterparts. And if we can't identify it for you, we have partnerships in place who can. 
We work very closely with Tom Colarusso, and he is with the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. And Tom and I partner a couple times a year, a couple times a year to conduct invasive insect forest surveys. So we're looking for invaders in the trees, and he is wonderful to work with. We have a lot of questions coming in from the public. And like I said, if we can't answer it, we have those partnerships in place who can. If you can grab a bug, that is super helpful. So if you can grab an actual specimen, that will be perfect for identification. Next best thing is a couple of photos from different angles. Take a photo of the top and bottom of the bug, the front and back, and that will really, really help with identification because a lot of these invaders are difficult to pinpoint as invasive. Yeah, and we'll make sure we'll put the uh, phone number and the website on uh, a link on our website so the people can access it from the Daclan radio site. Awesome. And going back to the invasive insects, the hemlock woolly adelgid in the southern states is called the gray ghost. And there are vast expanses of hemlock forest in the south that are completely devoid of needles and you have these dead trees on the landscape. And that is exactly what we're trying to prevent here in Hamilton County in the Adirondacks. We don't want to see that level of invasion here in our forests. And there are amazing agencies that are working hand in hand to prevent the spread of these invasive species. And if they do come here, we have the mechanisms in place to either apply an herbicide, an insecticide, deploy some type of biocontrol, or figure out the best method for dealing with these invasive species. Yeah, I know some people get scared when you start talking about things like insecticides and Mm -hmm. herbicides, especially now with the organic movement being big. So um, what can you tell us about like some of these uh, prevent- preventive measures that would help maybe ease some of the... Sure, sure. With the, with the insecticides and herbicides, it's always good to analyze your trade-offs. If you have a hemlock tree on your property that your great-great-grandfather planted and you want to save that tree, Boy, the best way to do that is to apply an insecticide that will help to make sure that hemlock woolly adelgid will not impact that tree. Um, They are working on a number of biocontrols for these insects. Another really cool program, they're training dogs to sniff out some of these invasive insects. I kid you not. So dogs have an incredible sense of smell. And there are programs where these dogs are being trained to literally sniff out invasive insects. And they could be our our first line of, of defense against these invasive insects if the dogs are able to pick up the smell of an, an invasive insect and point to where it is. So there are some really neat alternatives that are out there. Um, there's also the do nothing option. If the infestation is so far gone, if you weigh the the amount if you weigh your options including the amount of money time it will cost to take care of the infestation there's always the do nothing option as well and what would the other than do nothing um (laughs) would that just we just let it run its course yeah you let it run its course yeah all right yeah um it's just funny or i'm sorry to uh do that uh it's just funny to me because when you mention dogs, I think of my dog Daisy, who's a bulldog, and she <laughs> she barely can make it from the chair to the food dish and bag before she's like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, I was going to say something. Let me think what it was. Uh, we were talking about oh, with uh, with the herbicides for the invasive plants. Our conservation technician, Lenny Crute, has gone through a rigorous certification process to treat Japanese knotweed. It's an invasive plant 
and it grows along riparian areas, so stream sides. A lot of people plant it as a hedgerow because it's so robust. It's great to separate you from your neighbors, but if you plant it, the entire neighborhood will plant it. It has a system of underground roots called rhizomes that extend through the soil, and these rhizomes shoot out. If they're broken, a new plant will spring from that broken rhizome. And so Japanese knotweed is a plant that's able to produce very, very quickly and form dense stands. And Lenny is a certified herbicide applicator for this. He's gone through the training. He knows when to apply it. He's not applying on windy days. He's not applying when it's rained. So the weather conditions have to be just perfect. And with the Japanese knotweed, there's a stem injector that he uses. So it's like a syringe and the needle is inserted into the cane and Lenny presses the trigger and he injects a specified volume of the herbicide based on the, the stand, the size of the stand. So it's all very, very controlled. It's very controlled and it's, it's, um, it's very safe. I saw how believe alleviates some of the um, fears that people have in that sort of thing because sure. people think of insecticides or poisons. Oh, definitely, like, definitely. Like yeah, um, but when but when applied when applied properly, I strongly feel that herbicide is the best method to either completely eradicate, completely get rid of, or really, you know, really close. Um, er it really closely eradicate. I, str I strongly feel that herbicide is the best method to control Japanese knotweed because it, it has been very, very successful. Yeah. Now, if I wanted to plant uh, something and I went to Lowe's or Home Depot and they have these huge garden sections, would it be smart uh, to con consult you and... Uh, the soil and water conservation before I buy something that may not work very well with the ecosystem. Certainly. We have uh, a couple of very great native plant lists that the Adirondack Park Agency and our, uh, our other partner, the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, have put out. Lenny could certainly come to your property, do a site visit, discuss with you what types of plants you're interested in. He'll be able to look at your soils, look at your light conditions, look at your at your at the soil saturation conditions and then make some great recommendations based on what you want to see flowers versus coniferous trees versus deciduous trees so Lenny is available to do site visits as well that is excellent and I know every spring the soil and water conservation you have your annual plant sale yes uh, as well I'd like to plug that Great, thank you. Yeah, we um, actually last week I had my nose to the grindstone getting everything online. Uh, we can accept credit cards or PayPal. And we take a lot of pride in offering only non-invasive plants and an overwhelming majority that are native to New York State and oh, the Adirondacks. Very good. Do you accept Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a that's that's become a big thing. But, uh, uh, now the Adirondacks is uh, a very unique place, as in you know it's a you know park reserve that's also lived in by you know at least the thousands of people it's it itself is larger than most national parks even like yellowstone and yosemite um that is a large area to try and cover and try to uh, make sure all these rules and regulations are put in place so um what do you have to, what does the soil water conservation have to do even in just Hamlet County, which is like the largest county uh, in New York, I believe, um, to help control these things. Right. So Hamilton County Soil and Water is a non-regulatory agency. So we have no jurisdiction. We can't make people do things on their private property. So we are a 
non-regulatory agency. We are able to empower residents who want to treat Japanese knotweed or purple loosestrife that they've been dealing with on their properties. Um, we're also able to give presentations to lake associations, fishing game clubs, rod and gun clubs for their membership. And um, I very much enjoy doing that any time of year. So I'm available for presentations. <laughs> Uh, your regulatory agencies are agencies like the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Adirondack Park Agency. So we're a little bit different from that. Yeah. So it's more about spreading the information around and hoping people will yes. take the time. Yes. And with our employees, we are able to go on private property and help people treat Japanese knotweed. So that is what makes us a unique agency. So we can't tell you what to do, but if you come to us and say, hey, could you help me treat this common reed grass on my property? We, with your permission, can go on your property and show you some best management practices to deal with those invasive plants. Excellent. Well, that's a, that's a lot of cool stuff, uh, cool things. Um... Let's see. Like we said, uh, you have we have lots of lakes, lots of ponds. We have lots of rivers and streams. Um, so you say it's very important that even if I go from like Louis Lake to Indian Lake to Lake Pleasant to Sacandaga to give it the forty hours time to make sure everything's all set, or at least visit a wash station with that high pressure wash, that high pressure hot water wash, and that will blast everything, everything off. With your fishing gear, you can use a couple of household cleaners. I've heard that 409 does a great job of getting rid of spiny water flea. We use the high test bleach at the district, so you can bleach your fishing line, you can bleach your lures, uh, the down, especially the down rigging cables, the anchor ropes, because spiny water flea uh, is about a half inch in length and it has a super long tail that's barbed. And those barbs allow it to get caught tangled on the down rigging cables on the fishing cables. And so when an angler is reeling in the line, he has a hundred of these things globbed onto his fishing line. And that's how they're moving from lake to lake, stuck on fishing gear because of their spines. But with this disinfection, you'll kill them on sight with your gear. Yeah. Now, are invasive species still a threat even in this weather? You know, it's winter. It doesn't look like winter. It's like 40, it was 40 degrees earlier today. Mm -hmm. But in the winter, it seems like, you know, everything, you know, dies off and, and, and the like. Are the invasive species still a threat even in this sort of weather? Right. So not this time of year. Things like the plants, they've died back for the season and they're getting ready to gear up and the plants will begin to move up through the soil before our native plants even think about coming up for the springtime. Um, spiny water flea has resting eggs that are that that are found in the bottom sediments of a lake and those will hatch when the water temperatures warm up to restart that life cycle again. Um, the invasive insects, they're usually in an egg or a larva or a pupa phase this time of year. So the adults are, are what are moving on the landscape during the summer and finding a mate and then laying an egg to start that life cycle again. So this time of year, we're not seeing a whole lot of invasive species on the landscape. They're gearing up for springtime. Right. Um... I've heard of some places using such methods as dredging, where you, you take like the bottom and you try to stir everything up so things that do kind of rest on the bottom can get uh, buried and the like. Would that be something that could be, could be feasible on our lakes? For invasive plants like variable leaf milfoil or Eurasian water milfoil, Dredging could be a disaster because these plants reproduce by fragments. So 
when you're dredging, you're really disturbing the sediments, you're disturbing those plants, you're breaking up bits and pieces of them, and those bits and pieces will fall to the sediment and then take root again. So something like a suction harvester, uh, a waterproof vacuum cleaner, would be a great method to deal with invasive plants like Eurasian water milfoil or variable leaf milfoil suck all the plants right up and make sure you don't have any fragments floating around in the water well that's uh that's a lot of good information um so if anyone would like more information on different methods to help uh keep these invasive species from ruining our beautiful environment you can go to the Soil and water conservation that's up by the county building, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right across left. from the tennis courts. Right, talk to the tennis courts. You can talk to Kaylin. She is a wonderful person to talk to. Um, very uh, energetic and, and does love her job. I can, I can say that. So thank you for coming in. Thank you. And if I may close with, with one final comment. The Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program has produced an incredible report that details the economic side of invasive species, what the cost is, the the decrease in shoreline value, the decrease in property, what we pay to deal with invasive species, and they are another fabulous resource. And APIP has found that there are incredible opportunities here in the Adirondacks to get rid of invasive species because our populations are so small for these invaders. We can really hammer them out and stomp invaders out. So I wanted to give a shout out to APIP because we do a lot of work with them and they are another fantastic resource. And that just, that sounds great. And a lot of people don't think of the economic standpoint other than you know taxes and the things like that but yes. um yeah it must take a lot of time and energy to have to go through like i said the one of the largest counties you know in you know in new york mm-hmm. let alone the largest you know adirondack because they're one of the largest just parks yes. uh, and to have to go through every single bit and hope that you find these things Yes. I read a statistic that said everyone in the United States is paying a dollar a day for invasive species. So it's a dollar out of your pocket, a dollar out of, a dollar out of my pocket right now to pay for the adverse impacts of invasive species. They come with a hefty price tag, which is why we do not want them here. Yeah. Now, do you come in contact with any sources outside of the United States in hopes that they will help? keep things on their end from coming over? I do know that we have a lot of partners, especially in the trade industry, and the United States is working closely with other countries to make sure that the packing, the the packing materials that are being used are invasive free, and that also, you know, this is a two-way street because whatever is coming into the United States, we are also shipping out overseas too. So this is certainly a two-way street for invasive species, but there are organizations on a national level that are in place that do address those global trade that that we find are moving these invasive species around and they are working hand in hand to make sure that they're decreasing these these spread mechanisms as much as possible and they are working together as partnerships Uh, that's great that's very great to hear so like i said thank you for coming and uh hopefully we'll have you back um i know you have a thing on erosion coming up Mm -hmm. so you know hopefully maybe we'll get to talk about that at a later date but uh yes thank you for coming and uh Everyone out there, uh, we'll put a link to the Soil and Water Conservation website and put the phone number on the website so you can uh, call for your recommendations, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. I know Caitlin is just waiting for those uh, for those phone calls. Bring them in, y'all. Bring them in. <laughs> Gary, thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Yeah, no problem. Uh, everyone out there, have a good night, too.